Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. My name is Jean G, and I'm a third year PhD candidate in the Energy Graduate Group. So as Ellie mentioned, this project is related to my research and in my role as a graduate student researcher at the PhD EV Center here. So today I want to talk about substituting internal combustion engine vehicles with plug-in vehicles and understanding how households vehicle portfolios affect their choice of what vehicle costs. So um, first we'll start with some background and motivation and uh, learn about why I'm interested in this research topic and uh, what are some knowledge that has already been discussed in this area of research. So to start off, um, some notions on terminology. When I say plug-in electric vehicles uh, or yeah, PEVs, I mean both the battery electric vehicles as well as plug-in hybrid. Um, and they are so interesting in this time of this transition from a lot of um, ICE vehicles to these PEVs because they're considered like technological substitutes for these ICE vehicles. And um, California has already mandate that, mandated that all sales of new vehicles has to be non-ICE vehicles by 2035. So we do expect to see a dramatic substitution from um, ICE vehicles to uh, PEVs. And some existing literature has already looked into what that substitution would look like and what it means for um, consumers to think about what vehicle class they are trying to purchase when they think about purchasing a PEV. So there is a work done by Jensen AL um, in, uh, they, they did it in, a, is it Netherlands? I don't want to say the country wrong, but um, it's in a European country and they looked at the state of preference data in terms of what households are going to choose, what type of vehicle class of PEVs they're going to choose. And we also have existing uh, literature work by economists who looked at um, the substitution between um, fuel efficiencies when households think about what vehicle they want to choose as like either an addition or replacement to their portfolio. So that's um, along the lines with like whether households want to choose a um, less fuel efficient vehicle, but maybe have larger cargo space and like complement that with a subcompact car that may have higher fuel efficiency. Um, this work has only been focused on conventional vehicles, so ICE vehicles, and not really looking um, into the potentials of PEVs and the substitution between ICE vehicles and PEVs. So that's sort of where uh, my work comes in, is that I want to leverage reveal preference data, uh, which as economists, we love to look at reveal preference data, and we want to understand how attributes of ICE vehicles and um, they are, uh, and the other vehicles that the households have in their portfolio may impact what vehicle class they choose when they're thinking about purchasing or leasing a PEV. So I want to then move on and talk a little bit about the methodology and just give you a little more background and get everyone on the same page about um, this method that I use, which is called discrete choice modeling. So this free choice modeling essentially describes, explains, and predicts the choices that are um, that decision makers make between discrete alternatives. So some examples for discrete alternatives that are relevant in this case is like whether the household decides to purchase an additional vehicle or they want to replace their existing vehicle, or when they make that decision, what class of vehicle do they purchase? Are they going to purchase a subcompact, SUV, or a compact, etc.? Some um, empirical modeling techniques that discrete choice modeling leverages is this technique called logistic regression. Um, and they employ a maximum likelihood estimation. And what that means is that in the estimation process, the model is trying to look for um, ways to give each explanatory variable that um, results in the most likely um, probability distribution of when the certain alternatives gets chosen. So then uh, moving naturally, the estimated coefficients here that represent the change in likelihood of the dependent variable being in a particular choice alternative versus the reference class per its unit change in the independent variable. So apologize in advance for the verboseness, but I think 
using this is going to help in understanding the estimation results later on. So now I'll talk a little bit about the data that I use. There are three main data sources in this research project. First, I use the survey data on PEV adopters in California. So this is the um, survey that had been conducted by the PHNPV Center. I use phase four and five, which was collected in, from 2018 to 2020. We focus on two vehicle households. So um, these two vehicle households have, um, um, but have decided to replace one of their existing vehicles with a PHEV or a VEV. And there are about um, 15, there are about uh, 6,000 of them in the sample. But for the current stage of the analysis, um, I'm using a sample of uh, 15, 136 households. I also included the demographics and household characteristics, which including the number of licensed drivers in the household, as well as the household income. Um, in addition to the survey data, I also use what's called a data one bin decoder. This is more of a industry uh, database where they track all kinds of vehicle characteristics of vehicle attributes based on the VIN, uh, the vehicle identification number of the vehicle. So some data that I pull from that database, including the MSRP of all the vehicles, as well as the uh, fuel efficiency, the MPG. And then lastly, um, I use a data set that's from the CEC, California Energy Commission. And that data set gives me the vehicle class of all of these vehicles, as long as the fuel type, as well as the fuel type. Oh yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry if you said this already, but what is MSRP? Uh, MSRP is the uh, mm, manufacturer. Yeah, value of the car manufacturer. So just the retail price. There you go. <laughs> yes. Gina, so yeah, go uh, ahead. Why do you use uh, like one point five thousand versus the whole six thousand from your data set that you selected? Yeah, so that is because we had three data sources and the cleaning and the merging between these three data sources are very time intensive. Um, and since we're still at such an early phase of the project, it's more important to understand the model specifications. Um, but I am also working on the data cleaning effort to make sure we get all 6,080 households. Okay, so now we'll talk about the model conceptualization. So in discrete choice modeling, um, the most important thing is identifying the choice sets. So here, when we kind of picture ourselves as this two vehicle households um, making decisions in the time frame of like 2018 to 2020, we first decide whether we want to replace vehicle A or vehicle B in our portfolio. Then we think about whether we want to choose a VEV or a PHEV. And depending on whether we want to choose a VEV and a PHEV, there are different vehicle classes which were available on the market. Um, so as you can see at the end of these decision tree, there are different uh, vehicle classes um, for, P for PHEV and for uh, BEV. So based on the decision tree I just showed you, I used a multinomial logit model to estimate the choice sets that was from 2018 to 2020. In this model, I included 24 alternatives alternatives in the utility function. What that means is that I just need to model all of the tree branches that you see on this, oops, that you see on this diagram here. There's a utility function associated with each choice. Um, the specification of the utility function, um, I drew a lot of uh, inspirations and insights from this publication by Brownstone AL in 1996, even though it has been um, almost 25 decades or yeah, 25 decades ago, but their research project was also on understanding um, how households substitute or how households um, adopt um, alternative fuel vehicles. And they used a um, state of preference data at the time, but 25 decades later, not decade, 25 years later, we have more uh, data on review preference, um, data on how households choose PEV. So I think there's still a lot of value in understanding how they model um, these utility functions um, 
of households who choose uh, PEVs. So in my specification, then I have um, these vehicle attributes that are the net capital cost of the vehicle portfolio, net operating cost, the kept vehicle market value, and the kept vehicle operating cost. I also included a Tesla dummy, as well as the number of licensed drivers. So these are the explanatory variables. As you can see, when I think about net capital costs and net operating costs, I try to take into consideration this portfolio effect where we're thinking of how households may make decisions, knowing that they're going to keep one car and then they're uh, replacing one of their existing vehicle with a PEV. The other thing to note is um, for the income variable, that income explanatory variable in this model, um, I interacted it with these cost terms, so like the net capital cost and net operating cost, um, just to get a sense of the sensitivities that folks from different income groups may have to these um, uh, cost items. So in the next slide, I'm gonna show some preliminary results and then we'll go through some of the highlights. Just wanna make sure I have time. Um, so the first thing I want to discuss is that um, all the variables that are in the first portion of the uh, table to your right, which is everything um, from compact car to BEV, these are what we call like constants in the regression model. So they pick up the effect that this, um, they pick up the effect that um, each of these categories have on the likelihood of a adopting a PEV. So the reference category here is a compact car. So in reference to compact car, um, all the other vehicle classes, as you can see, like the subcompact car, the midsize, the large car, the, their coefficients are negative. Um, so they are, uh, folks in this data set are like less likely to adopt those classes of vehicles uh, relative to compact car. However, when you look at the BEV coefficient, that is a positive coefficient. So that is indicating that folks are more likely to adopt a BEV compared to a PHEV in this data set. So um, in addition to the constants and what the constants are telling us, there are also a few interesting um, findings on the beta, the estimated beta coefficients. So when we look at the Tesla, the estimated effect that Tesla has on whether folks want to buy a BEV, it's very high. Um, so that is definitely something uh, I can't say that I was surprised by, but I was definitely, um, I was, I didn't, I definitely didn't expect the effect to be this big. So that is uh, something interesting. Um, so something I want to point out also is that when we look at um, compact car, mid-sized car, compact SUV and subcompact SUV. These are the vehicle classes that were available in both um, battery electric vehicle and the plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. So you can see that the BEV um, constant kind of captured the effect that uh, even though there are these vehicle classes available in both PHEV and BEV, um, the folks in this sample tended to prefer BEV. And then when you look at the um, Teslas that are in this data set, they are in the categories of mid-size car, compact SUV, and mid-size SUV. So if we didn't, if I didn't include a Tesla um, beta, co the Tesla variable, then these, um, the constants of those uh, three categories would be a lot greater. So it was a good idea to include the Tesla variable and see and like separately identify the effects that Tesla had versus like just these vehicle classes would have on people's um, likelihood to adopt PEVs. Go ahead, Meg. So just to make sure I'm understanding this right, these are referring to the cars that they already have and they already have them as a plug-in vehicle or these are the cars that they would be likely to purchase? Oh, they already bought it. Okay. Yeah. Bought or leased it. So that's how they ended up in the, in the data set. Yeah. In the survey data. Okay. And then what, what is this predicting? 
Um, this is not so much a prediction model or the purpose of it is to more so to understand what factors influence these right. folks' okay. uh, um, decision. Um, so yeah, it's just to understand like the magnitude of the effects that these different explanatory variables have on their decision to purchase um, different vehicle classes of PEVs. Okay. Um, so then looking a little bit into the beta coefficients, we also have like net capital costs generally have a slightly negative impact on um, folks' likelihoods to purchase PEVs. And that's consistent with the literature and brownstone AL net operating cost. That's the most I would say. Like um, that's the estimate that has the biggest variance. As you can see, like their standard error is pretty big. So one reason is that right now the um, calculation for net uh, net operating cost is just the um, uh, the fuel efficiency. So it doesn't really take into consideration like how much households drive. And I think that's like one area we really need to, I really need to focus on is like looking more into the behavioral contents of like how people use these cars. Um, so that's kind of a, a direction that I like to take this project um, forward with. So um, with that, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just wondering, did you uh, take the three uh, salary ranges that you chose from oh, yeah. the previous model or did you come up with yourself? Yeah, yeah, actually, that, that's a good point. Um, when I looked at these uh, salary ranges or household income ranges, this is definitely very skilled in terms of like this data set. When I looked at um, how the incomes was dis were distributed just from the sample of the households in this data set, um, this are like the 330th percentile. Um, so there are like about 30% of uh, households that have income that fall off between 50K to 149K, um, so on and so forth. Uh, but that definitely, this definitely does not like represent um, the average California households, for example. So I think the results in this analysis can only be used to understand what impacted these households in their decision to purchase PEVs and um, it's definitely not generalizable. Okay, so in terms of future directions, I think I already touched on uh, some of these, but um, to get a better sense of like, uh, the, to get a better estimate and, and actually paint a more complete picture of what's going on, I need to clean the rest of the data and then to expand the choice set to include model years from 2015 to 2017, because some of these 6,000 households actually purchased um, PEVs that were dated uh, before 2018. So it's important to understand what their choice alternatives were back in uh, 2015 to 2017. Um, I had to refine the computations of the operating cost. Also identify luxury versus standard PEV. Um, I noticed that the kept market value coefficient was kind of picking up some of these effects of whether households uh, would, whether like if they own a more expensive car uh, and they decided to keep that car, um, that had an effect on the likelihood of uh, adopting PEV. So it's important to kind of identify that effect. Um, I like to incorporate more vehicle attributes such as electric range and their acceleration. And then this is a more of a technical, class one is more of a technical advancement just to look into this mixed multinomial logic. And what that does is just, it captures the household heterogeneity uh, more accurately um, as a probability, as a probabilistic distribution of the beta coefficients. So instead of just me uh, identifying those income uh, percentiles, uh, as I mentioned to you, Fabian, is that the model itself kind of uh, looks at that distribution. So that will be the future uh, steps. And with that, I thank you all for your attention and now I'll take any questions. If you're online and have any questions, feel free to um, chat them or raise your hand and we'll get to you. I think we have some in the room. Yes? All right. Oh.
Thanks, Gene. Um, so when you're talking about net operating costs, I know that you're looking at what influence decision making. And so like me not being super familiar, I imagine that like maintenance of electric vehicles versus ICEs is different. But I don't know if that's common knowledge to like most purchasers. Like, do you think that this would be also an important consideration for that or is it not? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I also agree with you that the maintenance cost could look very different for ICE vehicles versus PEVs. Like with PEVs, there's no oil changes, um, but there may be other factors um, that could influence that maintenance cost. So um, in addition to like the driving behavior that I mentioned to sort of refine that computation of operating costs, it would be nice to look into the maintenance costs as well. Um, I have a quick question for the, for the costs. Is that, when you're looking at that data, is that the perceived cost or is that the actual cost? Oh, which cost do you mean? The capital cost or? Um, all like the, not the capital, but the, uh, like the maintenance and operating costs. Oh, I is see. Is that like the, the, whoever bought it, is that their perceived um, cost or is that like the actual cost? Yeah, so for the maintenance cost or how we calculate the maintenance cost right now, it's just their fuel efficiency. So we're assuming like if everyone drives the same mileage or if everyone like uses cars the same um, intensity, then that would be the maintenance cost. Co the only difference is in the fuel efficiency, which is like an unrealistic assumption. Um, but for the other costs, like the capital cost and the kit market value, we do have the actual data on how, uh, how much they purchased the vehicle for. Um, well, I should say we do have data on the MSRP. So we have the MSRP of those vehicles. And we also um, use the depreciation schedule to look for, uh, to compute their market value of the kept vehicle. Are, are these all brand new vehicles that are being bought or is this like- Most of them of are, them? yeah. Almost, I would say like almost 95% of these vehicles are new PEVs. Okay. Yeah, Mark. Are there any relevant like subsidies of like new purchases that were um, occurring during this like time period that you analyzed that might have also affected purchasing besides just like the suggested retail price? Mm. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting point. I think from what I from what I'm aware of is that a lot of these purchase incentives are not like vehicle class specific. So it's, they're just maybe like fuel type specific, like there may be incentives for um, PEVs in general or plug, um, yeah, PEVs or plug-in hybrid in general, but not like, but maybe not like, oh, the, um, there's an extra incentive for purchasing a subcompact PEV. Um, so that's my knowledge. I, I could be wrong. Yeah, that sounds right. I, I have a PEV and I bought it in 2019 and I got a government rebate. It didn't matter what kind of car I bought. Mm. It just mattered that I'd got it from the right manufacturer and their rebates haven't worn out yet. Right, right, yeah. So yeah, my knowledge is more like the rebates itself seem to be general. And that's why like when folks decide what vehicle class they choose, that could that could actually have an impact on like um, how much, um, how much, fuels get saved depending on what vehicles they replace. So there's a lot of implications there. Um, and I think like delving one level deeper than just the fuel type and looking into vehicle classes is uh, interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Jean. Yeah, thank you. So for that mark, I don't know if I missed this, but was the one class of vehicle that people were like more likely to replace than others? And was the one class of vehicle like of the electric or hybrid that people were more interested in getting than the others in their data sets? 
Um, so the reference category I chose was the compact car. So that's like compact PHEV because I had like an additional constant for capturing people's uh, preferences for BEV. So that's the reference category. And I think I chose that reference category because from 2018 to 2020, there were more compact PEVs and BEVs, like not a whole lot of SUVs that were PHEVs or BEV, um, but that's just because the study period. And as we can see, like nowadays, it's changing really rapidly. Um, so that was kind of my thinking going okay. into it. Gotcha. Cool. I think it's loading. Is you? Yeah. Yes? Okay. Oh, nice. Wow. Woo! You must have had some fancy graphics. Uh, that's funny. This is like a suggested picture. I'm like, yeah, that works. Thanks. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, all right. I'm just going to go for it. Hi, everybody. My name is Mark Lozano. I'm a KPC candidate in the Energy Graduate Group. Um, this is the last portion of my research. I previously did some work on analyzing emissions reduction strategies by local governments and applying life cycle assessment and life cycle cost assessment to them. And I also looked at ways that equity is incorporated into local climate action. And so the motivation for this research was to say, okay, I have an idea of what they're doing. I've made suggestions on what they can change or that they can do, but I don't necessarily have a feel for it what influences their decision-making and where it changes realistically feasible. Um, which brings us to the title, which is how do cities approach sustainability, a survey on the importance of life cycle assessment, equity and funding and local climate action planning. So one word I'll probably say a lot today is CAP, which stands for climate action plan. These are documents that local jurisdictions release to serve basically as roadmaps for emissions reductions over the next 10, 15, 20 years. Um, in these common action plans, they'll generate inventories for what their emissions are currently at, they'll set targets, and then they'll outline a number of strategies that they plan to implement to reduce their emissions. For these strategies, they'll include occasionally the expected emissions reductions for that implementation, expected costs, sources of funding, any co-benefits, etc. Um, this information varies between caps, but really this is the framework that guides local climate action. The study that I'm doing focuses on climate action plans in California. And as I said, my motivation was to move beyond just what's published and look at what their decision making is actually influenced by. Therefore, I have these three research questions that basically summarize my goals for this project. The first is to look at what factors that are considered during CAP planning and implementation and how do they rank compared to each other. The second question is how familiar the jurisdictional representatives are with life cycle assessment and life cycle cost assessment, which is relevant to my work and see what role that methodology can play, as well as equity and um, other factors. Finally, I'm looking at just other general questions as to what influences their decision making, uh, what, how they fund projects, how they assess progress, how they report updates, etc. I did this through a survey, a web-based survey, which can be split into two general components. The first is a quantitative section where I list a number of key factors and they are given five options to rank their level of consideration. I'll go a little bit more into that in the next slide. Um, and then the second part was a qualitative, more open-ended section where I just asked them questions and said, can you please elaborate on why you feel one way or another? The target audience, again, was representatives from local jurisdictions. So I got this list uh, through kind of action plans, you're just contacting sustainability at city and saying, hey, who is the relevant person here? Can you please uh, direct me to them so that I can ask them to fill my survey? I distributed it through Qualtrics, and at the end of the day, I got 25 responses, which was a 78% response rate. A lot of follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also compared response to some other the data from the cities, but there was no correlation there. Now, looking at the quantitative questions, um, specifically, I asked them, how much did you consider the following eight factors during planning? And I also asked them, how much did you consider them during implementation? They were given five options to report their level of consideration ranging from not at all to a great deal. And in processing my results, I converted those responses to a numerical value. And then I normalized those responses according to the average score in each phase. So the responses within planning and the responses for implementation. Now, the reason that I did this is because I didn't care so much about the raw level of consideration, but really the relative consideration 
between these factors. So if, for example, we have four factors that are considered. The first factor gets a score of five, top consideration. We have two fours and a three. The average score is four. So if we normalize it by the average score, we get a plus one for the first factor, two zeros, and then a negative one, which basically means the first factor has above level average of consideration, whereas the fourth factor has below level average, uh, below average levels of consideration. So before we like get lost in the graph, I'll just walk you through what the factors are that we considered. The first was the emissions reduction potential of the considered uh, strategy. The next was the expected cost. Then we have the impacts on local pollution levels, followed by the stated local priorities of the constituents to the representatives. Then we have impacts on the local community, impacts on the external community, as well as impacts specifically on disadvantaged communities. So this is that equity portion. And finally, I also included the timeline of implementation. So how quickly these projects can get pulled out. Now here I have a box and whiskers plot of the raw scores. Um, really what I want to highlight is one, the number of outliers that we have in the data set. And two, that once we get to the five score, we're losing that whisker. So we have a number of fives and it's really hard to distinguish the distribution of these responses. Whereas once we apply the normalization factor, we got something that looks more like the box and measures plot that we would expect. And we're also able to remove all but one of the outliers. So that was a pretty impactful to me. We can then take this information and graph it according to the average score that each of these factors got. And that's how we get this graph here. So all of the bars that are above zero receive an average score that is above average levels of consideration and those that are below the axis receive on average less than average levels of consideration. And I also included the error bars, which is the 95% confidence interval of those factors. Now, the ones that are statistically significant are highlighted here, so I'll walk through those really quickly. The expected emissions reduction was considered above average for both planning and implementation. The cost was considered above average for implementation only. Local priorities received above average levels of consideration during the planning phase. And then local impacts received more consideration for both phases. On the other hand, local pollution, so the impact on local pollution received less consideration during implementation and external impacts, so impacts that occur to communities outside of the jurisdiction that is implementing this kind of action plan received less than average levels of consideration. Another thing that I wanted to look at was comparing this consideration between the phases. So or is there anything that's considered more during planning than implementation or vice versa? And that's what we have here. And we see that cost received significantly more consideration during implementation than it did during planning. And on the other hand, the stated local priorities of the community received more consideration during the planning phase than it did during implementation. And I would say if you take three seconds to think about it, this is a pretty expected result, but it was pretty cool to see that um, the survey results basically were in line with what we would expect. When we look at life cycle assessment and life cycle cost assessment, which are strategies to look at emissions over a long period of time and over um, basically additional considerations than just the point of implementation. Um, I asked them how familiar they were with these concepts and they received a score of three, which was just about a moderate amount, whereas life cycle cost assessment got a score of 2.36, which was between a little and a moderate amount. Basically, they're kind of familiar, not quite that much. I then provided a paragraph explaining what these concepts are and then asked them basically for information on whether they think this could play a role in the future, why or why not. They said, by and large, that life cycle assessment can play a really big role and is obviously important in getting a more holistic understanding of the expected environmental impacts and costs. But the data needs are just very high, it's very resource intensive, and it's not necessarily feasible for them to ask for these uh, additional data, especially when they're occasionally struggling to implement the plans in the first place. Life cycle cost assessment in particular was praised for being a promoter of high capital cost projects. So even if you have a project that has a high initial cost, if you're able to show that over the next 10, 15, 20, 25 years, you're going to get a lot of fiscal benefits that end up outweighing the initial cost that can be a big proponent in pushing that project through. Others still said that the decision to use life cycle assessment isn't necessarily their own. It either falls to the consulting firm that they use to help generate their kind of action plan and include that quantitative data, or it falls onto the implementing agency. So for example, if you're looking at 
a concrete rehabilitation project for the streets, the decision isn't by the local government, rather it's the implementing agency to say, okay, what mix of concrete are we going to use? What are the associated environmental impacts? And we'll make a decision on like, what is the best way to move forward? Some other major takeaways are listed here. When we talk about equity as a whole, they're highly familiar with it. It had a score of 4.64, almost a five. Um, and by and large, what the jurisdictions reported was that the inclusion of equity has increased, mainly due to a strong push by the community to have these factors included in their climate action. They also frequently highlighted equity-centered funding as key in promoting equity-centered projects. <laughs> um, when we asked about life cycle equity specifically, so looking at impacts on communities outside of the jurisdiction, they essentially reported that they have limited control over what happens outside of their borders at the state, national, and international level based on, for example, if you look at Amazon packaging, they don't have control over whether Amazon the sustainable packaging or not. When we looked at funding, there are city general funds that they generate year after year that they can use to promote these projects, but more than city funds, uh, jurisdictions reported external grants as being the major contributors to their implementation. So they're both state and federal grants that oftentimes have very specific goals or um, push specific types of projects. They also, of course, reference community generated fees, but sometimes reference free and volunteer work in order to update their caps or to implement projects. So I think that that was also a pretty key finding was they're so under resourced, they're literally <laughs> working for free to make uh, these impact happen. Finally, when we look at the implementation of project, they cited budget or the cost of these projects, as well as political will to be the biggest influencing factors on whether a project gets implemented or not. So if we look forward, what I would say is that similar work should consider political will as a key factor if there to do a similar Likert scale type question um, that I did in this research. Additionally, when I was looking through the responses, I realized that there's overlap between internal, like interjurisdictional impacts, external impacts, and disadvantage, like impacts on disadvantaged communities. So I feel like those are a little bit confounding, um, which could have skewed results a little bit. And then by and large, the local jurisdictions report just not having enough resources, but specifically also highlighting the fact that these resources or these sources of funding often have directed goals. And so it might be helpful to have more flexible funding so that each jurisdiction can have these projects that they decide are best for their community. I think I missed this. What's DAC? Oh, DAC is disadvantaged community. Yeah, sorry. And yeah, that is my presentation. So thank you guys so much. Great questions for Mark. Yeah, thank you. So my question is uh, around political will. Mm -hmm. So in your in your survey, that was uh, the respondents said that's an important factor, but did they provide any more insights into like what are some indicators that you could potentially measure of political will? Um, no, they didn't necessarily say how to measure political will, but my understanding is that you have a push basically by representatives or by, you know, the mayor or by the state to fund specific types of projects. So right now, for example, I think electrification is a really big one. And so even if you have something outside of that scope, um, electrification seems to be popular both with politicians and like government representatives as well as like ranking well with communities of like being very visible change and so um yeah i think that's kind of how they approach political will as like mm. nice. yeah i'm curious if you know anything about the level of community engagement that the different cities are like what kind of efforts they're doing to have more people participate in making the cap? So like I in, asked, uh -huh. well, just like in Davis, I know they have um, like the commissions and then they have these public opportunities and workshops for people to tell them what they want. Um, and maybe other places do more or less, but it might be interesting to see if that affects how the different things are weighted. That's a good point. I think that that specifically would play a role into, you know, the stated impacts or the stated preferences of the local community, which yeah. plays a very large role in planning and not so much in implementation, which is kind of what I had expected. And so one of the questions that I asked them was how often do you report back to your constituents, right? Because it's one thing to say the 
or implement, let's get your feedback, let's see what you want. But then at the point of implementation and further on down the line, how engaged are these community members? Um, and so responses to that question were sometimes great. Like we have an online dashboard that tracks the progress across all of our projects that is available to our community members and it's frequently updated and they can look at where their money is going and where our efforts are going to. And then others will say that they will like write a report every two years and how well that report is actually distributed is unknown. Um, I think your question was pointed a little bit more towards like the early stage engagement, at least that's specifically what I think Davis is there right now because I know that they're currently developing the climate action plan. Um, but I think just as important as early stage engagement is continuous engagement um, through climate action. So I have a quick brief presentation. I have a question on the external impact. So do you feel like maybe this finding, of course it makes sense, right? You're at a local level. We don't really care about what's going on with our neighbors, but maybe some kind of uh, external database or something to that effect to where the local communities can like put their, okay, this is our plan and this is how, you know, this would affect the external community. And then that, that the information be compiled to kind of mit minimize the external impacts or do you feel like that's just a natural or inherent part of a local climate action plan? Like we don't care about what's going on around us because we're trying to do our stuff. Um, I think there's there's a two part response to that. One is that there are communities that do collaborate across jurisdictions, and so they have regional climate action plans where they incorporate us like a slightly larger scope to the ways that uh, these approaches to sustainability affect different communities, um, whether by climate region or by like city region or like larger metropolitan region. Um, but the other question talking about, um, wait, what was the second part of your question? No, I, I think that pretty much is. I was just curious if like making an external collaboration would like help. Oh, or better. if like cities are um, inherently feeling like they don't care about external yeah. impacts. I think that part of that is tied back to a limit of resources, right? Um, like how well can they actually track impacts across uh, jurisdictions are outside of their jurisdiction, right? Um, and so I think that this calls either for more of these like regional planning type documents or really state uh, promoted policy that encourages this like cross jurisdictional thinking. Um, because at least right now, the directive towards local governments to set your goals and then achieve them, you know, without necessarily guiding action to, you know, collaborate with your neighbors. Obviously, um, well, not obviously. Through communication with jurisdictional representatives, there is like a stated interaction and sharing of information. Um, and there's like international um, organizations like the House of Mayors, where cities across the globe also share information on how they approach climate action. But when we talk specifically about impacts outside of those jurisdictions, I do think that it needs to come back to um, more like explicit um, requirement for like considering those impacts. We had a comment slash question um, from the Zoom audience here. Political influences on whether a cap idea is implemented might be quite large. For example, for the Rancho Cordova cap, um, the, this person suggested endorsing gray water systems and teaching GHG analysis uh, for the Mather Air Show participants pilots. Knowing how unpopular these ideas are makes me wonder about how to improve effectiveness, maybe education. Yeah, I think education reporting is a really big thing. And I know like with my group had communication about how do you best engage with uh, a diverse population within your city, right? Especially when, you know, as a first example, language barrier, right? Like, are you sufficiently addressing the fact that there might be two or three predominant languages in your communities and not necessarily just English? Um, also, do you want to be going door to door? Because some people will see a stranger knocking on their door and not want to open it, pretend like they're not home, right? So how do you actually distribute this resource? How do you distribute this information? Um, and that's a quintessential question that I don't think anyone necessarily has an answer to, but um, that comment definitely highlights the importance of this. All right, any other so, last, oh, we got a last question back there. Yeah, last question, I think this is like way outside the scope of your work, but I think it's like really cool, all these like variables that you say, like this is something you're thinking about, this is something that you're not thinking about. Um, but would there be a way you think to like actually see like, okay, you thought about this and then like what actually happened? Like did, so you cared about, you say you cared about the community, but like did the community really like after the fact like felt hurt or like you say you didn't care about other communities, 
like were they harmed to see like how much these variables actually had like a real impact like in the climate action. No, actually, that's extremely important and it ties back, I think, to what I tried to answer when one of my questions was how often do you report progress? Mm -hmm. um, and are you able to report pro progress and what information is included in these progress reports, right? Um, yeah, I don't necessarily have an answer as to like whether they do or don't. I think that every city uh, does something different based on their capacity, right? Like, mm -hmm. I know, for example, at least uh, two jurisdictions that I spoke with said, I'd love to participate in your survey, but we're like extremely behind on our own implementation. Like, I don't have 15 minutes to spare, but like, best of luck, you know? <laughs> Which, I mean, I don't blame them. It, they're doing this out of their own free will, and I'm extremely grateful um, for all of my respondents and even the ones that. Um, simply just send me email like I can't do this right now. But um, yeah, as you said, I mean, tracking the actual progress and then reporting that back to your constituents so that they know that they're actually being considered is uh, really important. And I don't know of like an efficient way for local governments to do that, especially if they're under resourced. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have one immediate thought to that was, I think it also kind of ties back to what you're saying about flexible funding. Mm -hmm. and governments being able to kind of decide what the best way to engage with people might be. Um, but something else I was thinking about was that it would be interesting to see also what measures they ended up putting in their cap based on what these priorities were. Like if they were more likely to look at transportation or like electric vehicles versus public transportation or other kind of like making multifamily buildings energy efficient versus other, I don't know, it would be interesting to see kind of if this affected which actions they ended up choosing. Yeah, I wonder if there could be like a case study where, you know, for example, if you were to actively track engagement in like the Davis cap, for example, and see what is it that communities are expressing as being important. And then, you know, down the line say like, okay, now they've released their caps, how does that line up with what? I like documented as being expressed. Like, are they implementing more public transportation or is it Davis? And so they only care about bike lanes, right? Um, so, yeah, I think that would be really neat for sure. If it was like, how old are most of these caps? Like, how? Um, the oldest climate action plan that I looked at was, I think, 2009, and they oh. haven't released an update since then. Oh. Um, but it was a, a fairly even distribution from then until, you know, one, I think, was the last cap that I saw, um, which was an update of like the cap that they had released maybe eight years prior. Okay. But yeah, I'd say every year there was between like one and I think at most four that happened to be released. And, okay. and you did 25, and so and that's in the state of California. Yeah, so I, I reviewed, I think, 34 kind of action plans. And then from there, uh, emailed a bunch and then got those kind of responses from the things that I asked them to do. Great. Cool. All right. Maybe you grab a burrito on your way out. I can't. I have a oh, you've got to go. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, someone wants to know, did Rancho Cordova cap staff participate? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. <laughs> also, maybe that's confidential information. I don't know. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. No, I, I really don't know off the top of my head. <laughs> so. Got it.